नमस्कार ज्योतिर्मय वेलकम टू हिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन एंड कंग्रेचुलेशन ऑन योर न्यू बुक थैंक यू जी लवली टू हैव आई एम सो ग्लैड यू आर पार्ट ऑफ दिस सीरीज थैंक यू um so you were saying earlier that when we spoke that you don't have your earliest memories are of music and the love of animals uh and yet there is a childhood memory of uh, of violence would you like to just maybe say something about that before we begin i think my first memory of violence was violence is war uh 71 uh the war with uh, for the liberation of bangladesh uh that that was the first memory uh, we i remember us plastering our windows with newspapers or brown paper etc and then the sirens would be going on uh, at some point of time there would be blackouts and so on and so forth and i asked uh, at home um, various people what what this was all about and you know i was told that this is a war so what happens in a war um, people kill each other and so on and so forth so the family which didn't believe in the kind of debilitating binaries that we believe in today uh, so you know uh, there was in there was in this kind of hysteria that uh, we create today for even a firecracker going on uh, on either side yeah. but that's my that's my first abiding uh, Uh, memory of uh, violence right now as a grown up as a scholar i think very early in your career you were drawn to the study of hindu nationalism is there any context that you would like to share on what evoked your curiosity and because you've given a great deal of your scholarly time to that subject yeah i mean i my 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 ac- academic career began as being a classicist of the western world so for many years in england i studied greece and rome greek philosophy and thought and roman philosophy and thought and uh, after that uh, uh, you know the, 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 that interest continued for a long time and then um, uh obviously the context was the demolition of the mosque uh, in 1992 uh, which happened just a month before i returned from england to india um the riots that followed i was caught in the second round of the riots in 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 bombay on the 10th of january uh, attending an exhibition in jangirat gallery and the riots started it was difficult getting back home uh bhupen kakkar exhibition i remember and then after that uh, the rath yatra etc had happened the, the the onward march of uh, the, the whole business of uh, religion entering politics and i was i was a little perplexed because forget the forget the hindu nationalists the discourse that was emerging from uh, what are called the left liberals or whatever um i found it a little clumsy to put it mildly uh because the rhetoric of the left liberals was exactly the same as the hindu nationalists uh at a methodological level that is there is a good nationalism and there is a bad nationalism so depending on what side you chose you are either on the good side or the bad side and each would consider their side to be the good side each side thought that god truth and everything else was on their side and it was also in a certain sense a question of heroes and heroism and so on and so forth and and at which point i thought that one had to disengage the whole enterprise of looking at what's happening to us i mean if that was the basic question what is happening to us uh from the question of nationalism nationalism had played its role as an emancipatory idea during the freedom movement as much as it 
has played a role in every post colonial society but it has become it has become a hindrance in many ways in many countries it's become debilitating it's become even toxic in many many post colonial countries and the moment you disengage the discourse in india uh, as to what happened from the 19th century who are we in in this post colonial period um then you have to disengage it from nationalism that's that's part one of the answer part two of the answer is a very simple one part two of the answer is simply this that all of the left liberal well majority not all majority of the left liberal discourse in india in every sense implicitly or explicitly believes that modern india contemporary india is just colonial and post colonial they will they will write uh, learned texts about orientalism they will write learned texts about edward said and so on and so forth but very few of the people commenting on a contemporary period have any sense of the pre colonial period they don't have the languages they don't know the texts i think the problem lies in the fact that india as we know it good bad ugly whatever it is can't be just a subset of the colonial and post colonial because then you know you would have to make the argument that the colonial subject while he was enslaved politically and sometimes even physically had lost completely his or her sense of agency yes which is which is not possible and so in a certain sense i was fortunate to know sanskrit i had a sense of ancient india medieval india uh, an interest in it as well and when i started looking at the 19th century i realized that in every way we are in a continuum uh of some sorts and that whole exercise uh, came to fruition in a way uh, before the book we are discussing today where i did a small book in 2019 which came out in india in 2020 got eclipsed slightly because of the covid business but it was noticed by many which is the translation from sanskrit to english of a 13th 14th century political satire called hasyarnava the ocean of mirth if you look at that text and i have i've translated it from sanskrit to english and written a longish introduction if you look at that text you change the names of the characters you can find each and every one of them in today's india you can find everything that happened then today so instead of very glibly and uh, lazily saying oh we have become fascist or we have become this or totalitarian or authoritarian i think what we need to do is to say it was the same a long time ago in fact what we have become is pre colonial in more than one sense not in this silly sense of imagined communities that people regurgitate that phrase you know that people invent a past which is imagined yeah they do but if you look at a 13th century text and even if you do a literal reading of it you realize yahan bhi corruption hai yahan bhi corruption hai us waqt bhi raja jo hai wo मूर्ख भी था करप भी था क्रूअल भी था आज भी है उस जमाने में भी लिंचिंग होती थी आज भी होती है उस जमाने में भी दोज पीपल हुर मार्जिनलाइज हुर एक्सक्लूडेड फ्रॉम सोसाइटी हैड ग्रेटर विजडम एंड वर्च्यू देन पीपल हु आर सपोजेडली द मेन स्ट्रीम सो आई थिंक आई थिंक दैट वॉज द सेकेंड Uh, uh, impulse that drove me to look at uh, Hindu nationalism, Hindu identity. What I actually uh, more academically uh, 
uh, jargonized terms called Hindu self images. Yeah. Um, kaun hai? And when I look into the mirror and say, if I say, and why is this identity a primary privileged identity? Because when I got up in the morning, and I'm not very much a morning person, I'm not an early morning person. I didn't say to myself, Are, I am a Hindu. All I was conscious of is the puffiness in my face <laughs> because I slept very late. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I think I think one has to one has to question why do we privilege something and not another thing? So that was the second one. Very briefly and quickly, the third impulse in, in, in studying this also was the whole question of canon and genealogy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way you look at it, um, I, was, I was traveling in Gurgaon once and you know, you have those trucks going on the highway mm -hmm. and they have these uh, little shares at the back of the truck. And when my Hindutva book came out in, uh, in, in 2003, 2004, um, I, I, I was not in Delhi at that point of time. I was in Hyderabad visiting a friend in Delhi. And uh, this friend actually lived in Gurgaon. So I was traveling in a taxi from Delhi to Gurgaon. And I read this line. And it said, Neki kar jute kha, maine bhi khaye hai, tu bhi kha. And I said to myself, that's the fate that I'm experiencing after the publication of my book. Because obviously the, obviously the, the right wing doesn't uh, approve of it. The Hindu nationalists don't approve of it. I, that's understandable. But a lot of left friends also disapproved of it. Why have you included Vivekananda in Hindu nationalism? Why have you included Arbindo Ghosh in uh, Hindu nationalism? I have no personal enmity against any of these illustrious people. I'm, I'm far too small to have any, anything and far too young to have anything. When you look at ideas and not personalities, then boundaries collapse. Yes, indeed. So I think, I think also it is also an attempt to reconstitute a deeper archaeology and a deeper genealogy of who we are. Excellent. Sorry for this long-winded answer. No, it's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, because it, I think, creates a very helpful context for our discussion. Uh, so before we come to the book proper, uh, Elusive Nonviolence, I wanted you to perhaps speak about a paper that you wrote, uh, which I think is published in 2019. Violence Affirmed, V.D. Savarkar, and the Fear of Nonviolence in Hindu Nationalist Thought. Yeah. Uh, because uh, this, see, uh, we've had an earlier Ahimsa conversation uh, with uh, Bhavar Meghwanshi, who is an activist, a social and political activist uh, in Rajasthan at the grassroots. And he talks about growing up in the uh, Shakha, RSS Shakha, where yeah. as a child, he says he was taught that nonviolence is cowardice. And it is because of Ashoka adopting Buddha's thinking that India was uh, enslaved. And then Gandhi finished off this job by making things worse. So how old is this idea of nonviolence as cowardice? And uh, can you just briefly kind of recount uh, what this paper says, violence affirmed? Sure. Thank you. What's interesting, of course, is, I mean, people hate me for saying this, but you see this entire enterprise from the 19th century onwards. While it has, it has pre-colonial roots, ideas flowing in, the entire enterprise is a modernist one including Gandhi, a modernist enterprise of reclaiming a past and so on and so forth. I come from, I, my origins are in Rajasthan, in Udaipur. You go to a village and say, 
अच्छा आप अपने ओरिजिन के बारे में बताइए और टेल अस अबाउट योर बिगनिंग्स एंड दे वुड टेल यू अबाउट यू नो देर लोकल बिगनिंग्स दिस होल एब्सट्रैक्ट आइडिया ऑफ नेशन कमिंग इन टू बींग एक्सेट्रा इज अ मॉडर्न एंटरप्राइज इट्स इट्स नॉट इट्स नॉट समथिंग विच पीपल यू नो आई मीन आई रिमेंबर माई सर्ज एंड ग्रैंड मदर हु वॉज फ्रॉम तमिलनाडु अराइविंग इन राजस्थान लर्निंग हिंदी and then attempting to do cases please you know patient come you to do zamane mein cases ki likhni padti thi so since when have you been afflicted with this he would ask whatever illness and they would say since the time now look look at the sense of time they have since the time the chili is ripening you know when did you have your first child when such and such maharaja sat on the throne so you had to know local history agricultural practices crops yeah everything it was a very Which, different sense of time and and space and location yeah whereas this enterprise is is very, very recent and in this recent enterprise there is this assumption which it's it's only nine late 18th 19th century that we are a peace loving people that we always extolled uh, peace and uh, non violence as a central concept and that hinges upon this stray phrase ahimsa parmo dharma um first of all while the phrase appears several places in the mahabharat in absolutely different contexts so the context is important the operative idea that is in the mahabharat is not ahimsa it is a concept which we have lost and it is a concept called anrasamsha non cruelty or non harm so in the most decisive moment in the mahabharat where yudhishthir has this conversation with the yaksha who has killed all his brothers and he says what is the highest dharma the yaksha asks uh, uh what what is the highest dharma beyond the vedas and yudhishthira says anrasamsha paramo and anrasamsha in sanskrit is not it's not the same family as ahimsa <coughs> so the word a anrasamsha here means full complete purn so anasamsha is actually compassion kindness mercy empathy mm. and as a consequence absence of cruelty so the emphasis is on the positive values and affirming the positives rather than avoiding the negatives because non harm and, is only yeah, a negative yeah yeah, yeah. and 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 also it book it in the context in which it's used in the mahabharat in various places it goes beyond caste and it goes beyond gender mm-hmm. and it goes beyond blood i see so even in the conversation with the yaksha when you when the yaksha finally is convinced of yudhishthira's answers and says okay i will revive uh, two of your brothers uh you just to ask for nakul to be revived uh, and not arjun or bhima and the yaksha says but he is only your half brother why do you want uh, him to be revived and yudhishthira says so that both my mothers can have one child alive at least khan samsha now in that paper that you have referred i discuss this in order to in order to foreground the fact that the idea that the buddha preached radical non violence is used by the entire ideological spectrum in india whether you are left right center everybody says the example of the buddha as the epitome of non violence the truth of the matter is that the buddha never preached non violence radical or otherwise explain the buddha 
included non-violence as part of the yamas and the niyamas that a bhikkhu ought to have. So it had the same status as brahmacharya, aparigraha, asteya, whatever. Right. There is, in my understanding, there is not a single line in the discourses of the Buddha, the Pali texts, where the Buddha says, I privilege non-violence above all else. In fact, it, in fact, there are people in these dialogues who go to the Buddha and say, such and such king has uh, been cruel and has meted out punishments which are gruesome. And I've given, I've given in a footnote a description of those tortures. And believe me, you, uh, I don't think uh, uh, the police in India uh, know about those uh, mercifully. Uh, we, we are still more conventional than uh, the tortures meted out in the Buddhist period. And the Buddha's answer when narrated these instances of physical violence, gruesome physical violence, would always be, has, have these punishments been meted out by a properly, legitimately anointed king? And the interlocutor would say, yes, then it's okay. Yeah. No, but then now, what why? happens to Karuna? Because Karuna is a fundamental Buddhist uh, teaching, isn't it? Karuna, there is nothing fundamental in Buddhism except one thing. And I'm coming to that. Okay. And that is, that is Nirvana. You see, the moment you disengage Buddhist metaphysics, from Buddha's ethics or psychology, then you get these instances of karuna being central, uh, ahimsa being central. You can then have a Buddha bar, Buddhist meditation, Buddhist diet. Uh, nee, but Nothing is I... central. Huh. No, go ahead. Sorry, just, go just, ahead. Just to finish. Nothing sure, sure. is central other than nirvana. There is no instrumental use of any term in Buddhism which doesn't finally cater to Nirvana. Uh, but isn't cruelty, wanton cruelty particularly, uh, to others an obstacle on the path of Nirvana and therefore the preference all, for all, Karuna? There is, in my understanding, there is no hierarchy. Achha. All karma leads to impediments in the way of nirvana. The body itself is an impediment. Gandhi echoes that when he says, as long as the body is there, there will be violence. I think we have far too long read the Buddha through the eyes of the Western Orientalists and Indologists. <clears throat> And we aren't familiar with the fantastic scholarship around Buddhist studies across the world. Not being done by Westerners. Uh, we talk about our great intellectual tradition, but it's, 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 it's Sri Lanka which manages to send two bhikkhus across to Harvard and make them learn the skills, modern analytical skills. But they are bhikkhus trained in traditional uh, knowledge. They come back and do the most fantastic translation, for instance, of the Pali texts. Yeah. So I think I think you know it's a it's a different proposition altogether. But but Jyotirbhai, there's the issue of how, uh, or rather, let me put it this way: Is it then also a mistelling of history uh, to believe what we have all been brought up to believe? that it was the Buddhist in inspiration. It was the introduction of a Buddhist spirituality in his life that led Ashoka to experience that intense remorse that he experiences after the war of Kalinga. And that we know is in edicts, right? So, the, I mean, there may be issues about how to interpret the edicts, but there is, it's, an, it's a vastly documented a historical event. So, how do you relate to that? 
what is interesting about ashoka is what he did after renouncing violence no but no because but first let us address this is it the buddhist influence no, 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 or I'm is it a... the question okay. no, i'm answering the question okay sorry sorry go what, ahead what, what he does after it answers what happens okay what happens simply is he becomes a fundamentalist the dhamma is to be so rigorously enforced that it is our first great experiment in social engineering that there is in fact a dhamma bureaucracy created by ashoka including dhamma spies in the harem now i think i think we need to you see you know this is part of the great secularism debate in india uh, you know what amrita sen uh, rather lazily calls the argumentative indian ki agar unke paas x y z hai so we will also counter pose you know one buddha one mahavira one kabir one nanak three or four bengalis you know they go included and secularism ho jayega doesn't happen that way i think we need to see your question is so profoundly weighty that it has to be answered in two ways one is what scholarship says scholarship says yes remorse whatever he converted to buddhism as he understood it what did he do after that what i just said do i find the myth of ashoka useful i do because it does provide a moral center to a lot of people it provides a vocabulary of the sense a given point of time but my problem with these vocabularies is this will will i publicly i mean this is public but would i say to people who are steeped in a certain ideology will i say to them that ashoka became a fundamentalist after his conversion he wanted dhamma to be sort of you know hammered into the people no i won't say that because the little positive gloss on ashoka that's there is useful politically is it useful in the long run i'm not sure because and this is the entry point as far as gandhi is also concerned idealism and imperfection don't go together when a tulsi das says to his god that you have to redeem me it's not my responsibility it's your business to redeem me wo to patit puratan kahi i'm an old papi because that doesn't say i'm all you know shining and bright and virtuous take the sufi angle to it main bhali hu buri hu tihari hu right now i think i think i think one has to factor this in we have a fascination for idealism in this country and you I, think that's a very old explore. phenomenon not a very old phenomenon it's again a modern phenomenon um uh, uh you know we, we we were fond of abstractions because they provided an escape abstractions were a myth which we clung on to mm-hmm. uh you know soul god everything the tribals didn't have the transcendental idea of god most adivasis don't most adivasi faiths don't have the notion of a transcendental idea of god if you have a transcendental idea of god then you will have sin you will have good karma you will have a big great beyond where you have to go where you will be rewarded or punished 
cycle of life uh, and uh, death, karma, all that. Whereas, if you have a non-transcendental idea of religion, it saves you from a lot of the allures of abstraction. So, in this context, Jodhirmai, how and why does the 19th century seem to be, and this is what I'm getting from your book also, and it's a familiar idea, I've seen it elsewhere, that the 19th century becomes a very important period where this question of what is essential Hinduism comes up. And a, that actually is the crux of your book in many ways, or at least it's a kind of a running theme. Yeah. That our, yeah. is, is to be Hindu mean that you're inherently non-violent or not. Uh, and, and, and because later on, I want to go back to your understanding of Savarkar. But let's first just deal with this idea or this phenomenon why is the 19th century so important for this question of whether Hinduism is essentially non-violent? No, I think, I think the 19th century is important not for Hinduism alone. It's important for the discovery by Indian elite of this little toy called nationalism. Very potent, very potent instrument, toy, Jobi Kanai after me. Nationalism as they received it, modern nationalism, the Mazzini, Bismarck kind of nationalism, which they discovered, there was there was there were a few features which they thought were essential for any nation. One was unity. Unity, okay. Unity. The second feature that was absolutely crucial, and this is common among all nationalists, is that every nation, modern nationalism said, must have a core, a center. A kind of essence. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Which was not present before modern nationalism evolved. Mm. Earlier forms of notions of state, etc. There was no this silly idea of a core or a center didn't exist. Now, Indian nationalists, by and large, saw that you must have a core. Now, the core can't be rationalism because the West had already taken strides, modern, modern rationalism, Cartes in rationalism. Can't have wealth as the core. Can't have science and technology as the core. And the caricatures that were present in the 19th century, largely due to the British rule, was that the Muslims, in terms of fighting spirit as warriors, were greater than the Hindus, you know, as, as people who... Savarkar, you wanted to talk about Savarkar. Savarkar says, you know, the Muslims arrived in India, is, is, He's, he's tracing the history of the arrival of uh, uh, Muslims in India, and he says they arrived. Uh, all those old caricatures, uh, he recounts, you know, sword in one hand, the Quran in the other, no caste, no divisions, unity, absolute unity, and they were a formidable force. And then he says, over a period of time, we realized that we had to become like them. This Savarkar is saying. Savarkar is saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They were, they were, they were a force that was extraordinary. And he says, and I quote, we found them irresistible. Now, irresistible in the Marathi original is not irresistible in terms of not being able to resist. Okay. It's irresistible in the sense I find this plate of ice cream irresistible. So a it's temptation. a kind of a temptation, an allurement. You see, now you, you can do that. So what, what people did in the 19th century were to say, we need a core, we need a core. What is that core that you need? 
they finally said it religion and they used the word religion and spirituality interchangeably it will take a long time to uh, you know talk about why they used it interchangeably because the german romantics had already started talking about spirit the idea of the spirit what you said essence spirit the geist you know the stuff of that sort montesquieu in france was writing spirit of the laws not the force of law spirit of the laws so yeah. spirit spirituality in the service of sovereignty was already an idea in europe we just took it religion then becomes the core but there was one question that had to be resolved which aspect of religion do you take yeah popular religion loge mushkil hogi the western mind had already taught these people that rituals were bad mm. religion had to be rationalized that was that was the protestant reform uh, reformations is entire team was that so what you are what i'm hearing you say is that we westernized our concept of religion even westernize the whole enterprise from the 19th century is in a certain sense west inspired they had to choose what aspects of religion do i take what how much of the west do i take that was also a question west kitna lena hai all of them were raving and ranting about the soulless technological civilization gandhi in hindusvaraj uh, raves and rants about you know reform and the western civilization being demonic and you know etc etc why are they doing that they are doing that only because what they have understood of it is that you must rationalize religion in a way on the one hand you are raving and ranting against technology on the other hand you are divesting religion of those very elements which makes it diverse which makes it popular which creates spaces in society rather than restricting spaces in society and therefore enhances creativity enhances creativity now gandhi say shaad karte hain log khana upar thodi jata hai अरे भाई खाना ऊपर नहीं जाता है बट अगर दो भाइयों में झगड़ा है तो साल में एक बार बाप के श्राद्ध के लिए मिलते हैं इट क्रिएट्स अ स्पेस फॉर कॉन्वर्जेशन एंड इट्स आल्सो ईटिंग फूड टुगेदर इज अ वेरी बेसिक री एफर्मेशन ऑफ लाइफ इट सेल्फ एंड कम्युनिटी यस 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 सो जो Yeah. No. Go ahead. Do you want to? Do you want no, to? No. 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 That, 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 that's all. So, no. This is a perfect place. Then you know to, uh, I think, really get into the substance of your book, because you are, I think, in a very intense way, exploring that how and why Gandhi sees a, a Hinduism as a search for truth through nonviolence, and yet. Gandhi also acknowledges the absence of non-violence as a core value in Hinduism. So this dynamic, if you can just walk us through, uh, you know how you have grappled so, with this in your book. You no, know, I think I think Gandhi's uniqueness among all the thinkers from the nineteenth century onwards is that he he realized uh, uh, he didn't he didn't buy into this trope of. we are essentially peaceful etc except for rhetorical purposes he also does that he very consciously recognizes that neither hinduism nor the hindus have ever been purely non violent and is this limited to the phenomenon of untouchability or untouchability as a form of structural no. violence is only one small part of this it's a very small part he acknowledges for instance i think chapter 3 or 4 begins with his letter to cf andrews where he says thai nahi and if people like buddha etc propose 
an element of non-violence, it never seeped into the consciousness of people. So that we, 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 we've always had violence, always had violence in the way Gandhi understood it. Now, having identified religion as the core of the nation, he wanted, wanted this religion, this entity he understood as Hinduism. And like all interpretations of religion, I also slightly depart from scholars who say, you know, 19th century construct. Everybody talks about a construct these days. Everything is a construct. Life itself is a construct. <laughs> you know, all religions are constructed. They are not cast in stone and forever there. So I have no problem with the construct. But what I'm interested in is, what Gandhi does is to say, Okay, if this is the core of the nation, if we agree that religion or spirituality or whatever you call it is the core of the nation, then we have to introduce non-violence as not merely a concept within Hinduism, but a foundational, central concept within Hinduism. And as far as truth and non-violence are concerned, sometimes he uses them interchangeably. Yes. So, you know, I think I think that 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 he does. And once he says it is introduced as nonviolence is introduced as a central concept in Hinduism, then the caste problem will go, the, the Muslim problem will go. He very consciously recognizes that that is a problem the Hindus have with the Muslims. Yeah, and he feels that. It will be sorted out once Hinduism sorts itself out. So is this why Gandhi rejects quite emphatically, you report this in your book, that he emphatically rejects the claim that it is Buddha and nonviolence that caused the downfall of India. He says, in fact, uh, and I'm quoting from your book, no. that we fell because we failed to live up to the Buddha and his teachings. Uh, so is there an echo also of Swami Vivekananda here? Because I was wondering if you could just share a bit of your scholarship on Vivekananda, because Vivekananda is also struggling with this dynamic of the impulse for no violence and yet the aspiration for non-violence. No, I think I think I think uh, you see the, uh, with Gandhi, the thing is when he says uh, the Buddha uh, also was not able to do this, that, or the other, uh, he doesn't consider Buddhism to be a religion. He he considers it to be part of Hinduism, which is problematic. So yeah. I think I think he's coming from uh, the, the the perspective that there is nothing in India which is not an extension of Hinduism. And then this 19th century belief that Hinduism is the father or the mother of all religions, that everything that is there in every religion is in Hinduism and so on and so forth. And Vivekananda was very much part of that continent. You see, there, you know, uh, the, the I, and this every religion does. So that is not, I mean, I, this is not unique to Hinduism. Every religion thinks that it's superior, it's, <coughs> its claims are superior, its doctrines are superior, and they construct uh, an argument around that superiority. And Vivekananda, in that sense, is only interesting in the sense of. It's the most radical manifestation of the westernization of this entity called Hinduism. I mean, he he's so taken in by this whole business of rationalizing religion. He's so enamored by modern nationalism that he is, I mean, in my book on Vivekananda, I find Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna Paramahans, it is so fascinating. A dualist, an Advaitin, a Tantric, a Bhakt, and a worshipper of Kali. 
and none of them is sought to be in the stupid banal manner in which we attempt to do all things there is no attempt to reconcile them mm. he is ready to live with this complexity mm. and respect for not diversity diversity yeah. is a word for unity actually and people say unity and diversity it basically is state propaganda diversity is different from difference mm. i am different from you in yeah. a profound radical sense and you cannot say that you will exist as part of my unity no i will challenge destabilize your unity if need be but we different so the idea of difference is counterpose against an idea of the normative the norm the normal uh no i ye nahi mujhe samajh aa raha uh, jyotima i am going to ask you to elaborate on this because hmm. um in our times today what is the problem with the concept of diversity at both opposite ends of the political spectrum if at all we want to be stuck with this left right which i actually find completely unhelpful um, yeah the core issue is conformity actually whether the it is conformity is with the liberal ideal or it is for conformity with some uh, purest uh, uh, identity uh, construct or, or you know identity formulation but in both contexts what is being forced upon people at many levels is conformity whereas your story of sri ramkrishna paramhans is very important because he refuses to conform to any one pigeon hole no i i have no disagreement there my only hmm. disagreement is on the word diversity ha ah, wohi main keh rahi hu usko thoda aur explain kariye that diversity ultimately in the way the word has evolved in the modern sense is something that the state approves of or even large groupings in society even in yeah, yeah. even at the level of samaj yeah 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 whereas difference is like the pebble in your rice which ruins your entire meal but why should it because i my now this is again only how we are uh, socialized and culturalized uh, that in the world in the india that my generation grew up in to be different was not to be a discomfort to be different was not to be out of uh, tune or out of sync with some very fixed way of you know playing the band i But think the... that is no what is going no i mean is that my peculiar you know experience in just my small family context or was this a... no, I think, no i think we all have these experiences in small measure but when one looks at the polity the state and the country i think from the very beginning uh, this idea of diversity was something which was an extension of the mercy and the grandeur and the and the and the largeness of the state now put it in an indian language and you get the sense uh okay let me give you an example which will maybe illustrate that what i am saying what i am referring to is not a peculiar you know kind of clan experience my father grew up in lahore right pre partition and when this communal conflict began in the late 80s and 90s that phase of it um he used to keep telling me that bhai in lahore and in many places in pakistan because there were no taps yet taps were still rare there used to be public water in big earthen jars okay with ladles and there was hindu pani and there was musliman pani 
and this was treated as a comfort and as a as a facility it was not treated as a basis of either it was not seen to be either discriminative nor was it treated as a signal of a impending conflict he now again this is his experience of it he says it was not very different from having a public toilet for women and a separate one for men because it's just a practical convenience muslims ate meat many hindus didn't want uh, to make contact with people mm. who were eating meat so there was hindu pani and musliman pani this was an experience or a illustration of a difference which was not a conflict inherently you see my favorite example for this is a story that arthur kessler narrates he says that there was a tribe of monkeys in japan living on two separate banks of a river so on the same tribe but some lived on the left say and some on the right of the river one one set of monkeys developed this curious habit of washing the fruit that they ate and the other monkeys remain non fruit washers and the question would arise and the question would arise would this create conflict and apparently it didn't so the fruit washing monkeys remain fruit washing monkeys and the non fruit washing monkeys remain non fruit washing monkeys now if you are a marxist you would say they didn't come into conflict because there was enough fruit going around so there was no competition for scarce resources if you were a liberal you would say they were tolerant monkeys but kessler says i think the real problem is that they didn't have the language to articulate difference so whether there was a hindu ghada and a muslim ghada and today the question of having these two segregations doesn't even arise because it would it would come in the vocabulary not of difference but discrimination today if you segregate the hindu or muslim ghada it's not a respect for difference but it's discrimination you can't have a brahmin ghada and no but at that time it was not experienced as discrimination yes because they didn't understand discrimination the way we understand discrimination that's what i yeah exactly yeah at that point of time also it was discrimination but what i'm trying to say is that the vocabulary that we use to explain diversity or difference or discrimination evolves over a period of time experiential and and that there were two separate ghadas i mean i have seen the absurdity you're talking about hindu muslim large question i studied in baroda where the department in which i studied uh, had a very very zealous uh, proponent of the discipline of international relations and he had got a special grant from ugc and the rest of us who did things like political theory or indian politics or public administration were were the were the lesser cousins in the common room there was an ir ghada international relations ghada and a ghada for the rest of them now was that difference diversity no was it discrimination no it was privilege so it depends on the context that's all i wanted to say yeah yeah yes yeah. uh yeah um the other issue that uh, very fascinating that you discuss in your book is the difference between savarkar's view of nonviolence savarkar you report sees nonviolence as being only for the renunciate the sadhu 
whereas gandhi sees it as being potentially accessible and strivable for the householder and can you little bit detail this difference and would it be fair to say that it is this issue of non violence that gets gandhi killed eventually no i don't i i, I don't know about the killing part um, okay. i i think i think uh, uh, the first part of it is that i don't think both savarkar and gandhi are saying things that are very different I and mean, it'll come as a shock to people but i don't think they are saying things that explain, are explain explain yeah 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 savarkar is saying this is for aesthetics this is for the enhancement right gandhi is saying it's for the masses but the masses have to perfect themselves follow the aesthetic way in order to realize pure non violence so no or, so he some, by, by doing that he is bringing the striving into the householder's domain this is an old this is an old uh, debate again this is a pre colonial debate whether asceticism could be something where the ascetic had to leave the world and go out into the forest or he could become he could have all the qualities of an ascetic remaining within the household and hence the whole business of nishkama karma was invented and gandhi is fascinated by it but starkly put savarkar dismisses non violence as belonging to the ascetic gandhi converts the same asceticism into political asceticism even in the hindu swaraj when he is talking about the satyagrahi there are codes of conduct which which are to do with the ascetic you will not marry you will not have property you will uh, you will uh, adhere to perfect brahmacharya look at gandhi's instructions to the satyagrahis when the satyagraha was the program was running they are all the do's and don'ts of an ascetic so in a certain sense his is a political ascetic fair enough uh, you also raised the question of whether gandhi's a typical reading of the gita grants him the right quote unquote right to restate hinduism what is your view on that you've no, done a great I... reportage and you know you've shared your scholarship on it but what is your own view on this i i wanted you to just share that i think i think i think any reading of the bhagavad gita minus the context of the mahabharata hmm. will fall short the mahabharata in my reading tells us one thing all humans are flawed all human endeavors will end in failure that imperfection is written within the dna of the world and within that text which talks about imperfection there is this this text called the bhagavad gita which talks about a certain ideal and the ideal is very very clear it's not about gandhi is reading is gandhi is reading i mean the book deals with it in great detail uh, i mean his his reading is you know very atypical uh, and, and and interesting uh, but what is what is absolutely clear is that arjuna's doubt whether he should kill or not kill is not about killing it's about killing his kin his yeah. relatives so it's a limited thing so i i if you ask me my personal opinion i wouldn't ever read the gita as it has come to become again this is a 19th century thing where the gita is sought to be made into the national or universal text of the hindus because the christian missionaries keep hammering you that you don't have a book you don't have a book so we needed a book so we invented a book 
that the Bhagavad Gita was only part of the exegetical tradition of certain scholars and Brahmins earlier. You know, not merely what we know popularly. Shankara, Ramanuja, Vallabha, Matva, you know, Madhusudan Saraswati, Abhinav Gupta, all sorts of people commented on it uh, in particular ways as part of a tradition. This whole thing that don't Gita part karo because it's the great spiritual text of India, that's something which is more recent. Yeah. So, so I wouldn't read the Bhagavad Gita like Gandhi does, minus the fantastic imperfections of the of the of the of all the characters in the Mahabharata. Hmm. Chaliye, this will be have to be another conversation where we can agree to disagree. <laughs> because I want to take in closing, I just wanted to quote a chapter from your book. Uh, this is towards the end where you write that someone writes to Gandhi in 1928 asking if it is not impractical to set forth Ahimsa as the highest religious ideal and code of conduct for humans, knowing that it is impossible for anyone to fulfill it. Gandhi's answer is comprehensive and complete, you write. The very virtue of a religious ideal, he says, is that it cannot be entirely realized in the flesh, but faith is impossible if perfection can indeed be realized while surrounded by all that is subject to decay. So then why elusive nonviolence? closing Why elusive? Especially since uh, you know, as Sudhir Chandra's book has so movingly conveyed that in those last eight, ten months of his life, when he is uh, repeatedly saying, he's putting it on record, that his own experiment with nonviolence politically has failed, uh, he never wavers in his faith that the ideal will uh, persist and it will it will continue and others hope, will yeah. Yeah, yeah. so how can you just locate your uh, notion then of elusive nonviolence in the kind of to, to well, well it's elusive because it's in the religious realm it's a it's elusive because it's in the religious realm the religious realm is circumscribed by a certain limited understanding of religion it is an understanding of religion which is uh, which is which is a majoritarian statist understanding of religion, and uh, it is it is uh, it is it is an understanding of nonviolence through religion, which doesn't help us to protect and reclaim the liberal and constitutional space that we are increasingly losing. I'm saying that there is a thin line that divides an idealist and a fundamentalist. A very, very thin line. It is the intolerance of different ideas, different perspectives. When B.G. Kher says to him, Mapu, what is wrong with covetous? It's so human. Why are you constantly raving and ranting about covetous? What is wrong with it? It's human. It's very human. Yes. Why are you constantly saying nah, you know, the violent non-violence of the coward versus the non-violence of the brave? What is the non-violence of the brave? Marja. His morbid, his morbid fascination with death. His his morbid fascination with with annihilation of the body. I think I think I think we have to revisit these ideas. Complete, complete discomfort with his own body. What he says about Jayadeva's Gita Govindam. I mean, this, this fear of the erotic, the fear of Shringar. He wants, he wants the book not to be read by anybody. The Gita Govindam. Now, that is what that is what regimes in India have done. Ye, ye kitab ashleel hai, ye, ye film ashleel hai, isko ban kar do. 
No, but uh, fair enough. I, I'm I'm not going to uh, get into this issue in any further detail. But I am tempted to quote back to you from your book, which is where you are quoting Gandhi uh, on what it is to be a Kshatriya. Killing is not the dharma of the Kshatriya. The Kshatriya who kills anyone weaker than himself is not a Kshatriya, but a murderer. One who stands up against a strong man in order to protect the weak and kills him in, is forgiven his violent action. But the true Kshatriya is he who not killing even a strong man, dies defending the weak. His dharma is to die, not to run away. So I see your point. I, I deliberately quoted this because it yeah, also... You're, 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 now you're selectively quoting. Because he also says that in the performance of duty, if you have to kill your father, kill him. That's right. Wo bhi hai. So no, the whole... So, the, so, ha, go ahead. No, no. I think, yeah, I think there is an argument. There is an argument which is organic in the book. You can pick up that I gave Gandhi all the space he requires so that people might not say, Aapne selectively quote karke Gandhi ka naam kharaab kar diya. No, no. On the contrary, I quoted that to reflect the range of what you are covering. No, no. See, the, when he says that, he also says that in the Bhagavad Gita ideal, if it means killing one's father, kill him. Have no remorse. Kill your father. I think. I think. I think. I'm. 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 I'm not. I. I have no interest in moksha. I have no interest in ending this cycle of life and birth. Most of us don't, even if we pretend to. I like this world very much. I love life very much. I like all the imperfections and the little perfections in this life. And I am frail. I am limited. I do not want to be Gandhi. See, had he read the Mahabharata closely, that is an instance where the interlocutor says, even if you are following dharma, you are still caught in the binaries of dharma and adharma. Even if you are an adherent to truth, you are still caught in the binary of truth and untruth. So, get rid of that. And after having got rid of it, the binaries, forget that you have got rid of anything. Because then you will become self righteous. Yaja dharma ma dharma cha ubhe satyan vide tyajaha. Leave dharma and adharma, leave truth and untruth. And having left them, forget that you have left anything. Yeah. What does what what does Bhishma say to Yudhishthira, who is who is who is a little proto Gandhi, agonizing about the fact that if as a Kshatriya I I am allowed to kill for food, but if I have enough to eat, should I kill or should I not kill? What does Bhishma say to him? Meat eating may be bad, but moral pride is worse. Moral pride is worse. So, maybe, the fascinating thing is that across the world, uh, over the since Gandhi's murder, uh, I'm not that Gandhi's murder is the marker for this. Just, just you know, for us to map time in this last seventy odd years. Um, both models of nonviolence have thrived. One that is rooted in some kind of spirituality or some kind of faith based uh, nonviolence, which is the Martin Luther King uh, experience. Uh, it's also, I think, the Dalai Lama's experience. Uh, but I'm just giving the big names. 
they only represent large volumes of people who are following them. Mm. And the mm. other track is people who have developed a uh, practice of non-violence, both in as a way of life and as a model, uh, as a mode of political protest, without any reference to spirituality, but rather to some kind of ethical frame. Yes, there is inevitably a reference back to compassion. And of course, perhaps the most famous example is Jean Shah, who very deliberately, uh, I think, aimed to excise the uh, precisely what I think you are saying, made nonviolence ex- elusive and, and therefore found very, uh, to some extent, replicable strategies no. and methods, you know, for, no. uh, for nonviolence as a means. And, and therefore, uh, would you say that Uh, in our context today that however that this particular model in with such a heavy anchoring in a particular view of the religious experience may be elusive is nonviolence itself doomed to be elusive is that your is that what you're sort of struggling with no I, i i i don't think i privilege any one thing over the other it depends on the context it depends on what what is what are the means and so on and so forth so i i i i i'm not uh, somebody who would say oh you know only non violence or only this or only that i think i think what we need is yeah i agree with you we need compassion great deal of compassion great deal of empathy and so on and so forth but i don't think that privileging any set of concepts out of their context uh, helps in any way so yes there are certain things that are desirable yeah non violence is desirable gandhi uh, uh, said to buber uh, you know marjo you know let the jews are not sincere in their non violence they must die by the thousands in order to transform hitler's heart he had he had the audacity and the presumption to know what hitler's heart was well, let's let's get real let's get real i mean let's really 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 get real he was writing letters to hitler saying uh, your deeds are demonic but i think you are ultimately a nice person because the same brahman emanates in all of us and he is in you also i i am not i am not rajni ready to pay the cost of this idealism because it's easy to talk about it yeah. but it is it is very difficult when when you are not privileged see this is all this non violence business as a mode of dissent to a great extent the talk of it not the practice is the talk of the privileged you see you know uh, all of us included what happens in villages what happens among the poor the women the destitute i don't think they have the privilege to say we will die but uphold non violence no well in all fairness that is not what contemporary non violence activism does at all Uh, the large in fact i would say almost the entirety of it equates nonviolence with the struggles for justice uh, i think when jp famously said and it's a it's a slogan that has echoed through this series uh, you know in the experience of very diverse activists ke hamla chahe jaisa hoga haath hamara nahi uthega it was not a call to mass suicide and i think uh, there is evidence for how no, no, i am i am i am no, no 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 we have we i am now i am out of my depth because i don't know much about non violent movements in india uh, it's not something i have looked at uh, i am going to come back to the book yes <laughs> yes no no and i i i was just for the sake of the 
uh, framing the issue. I was just bringing that in. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. in, in yeah, closing, but... would you like from this vast experience that you have of studying uh, Hinduism and nationalism in, and now in the context of the whole challenge of violence and nonviolence, is there any advice or any insights that you know you would like to share with young people? Because I meet a lot of young people who are struggling, you know, with how to live a creative and meaningful life in these times of conflict and and uh, polarization. So, any any kind of parting inspiration that you would like to leave? My young my, my my parting advice is. Don't ever give advice. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. Because the moment you try, start giving advice, you are telling somebody how he or she should live his life. Not always. Sometimes it's just worthwhile to share your own experience of, and usually no, that's let, what. Let, let people discover themselves. I'm a teacher and I tell my students half seriously and half uh, uh, jocularly. That there is there is there is no greater pleasure in life than seeing people make mistakes as long as they learn from it. Uh, so I I have no advice. I I don't uh, have any advice. Live your life as you want to live. And 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 uh, you know whether it's good, bad, ugly, whatever way you want to live your life. Enough enough. Uh, sanctimoniousness has been thrust into your gullet. I don't know what to do more of it. I think I think uh, the best thing for youngsters is for them to be left alone. Thank you so much for being part of the series. Thank you. All Thank the you best. So yeah, yeah. Thank you.